right. Take your Bibles. Open, please, to the book of Malachi. Last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. It's good to be here. Amen. Good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. Good to be with God's people. Jesus said, where two or three are met together in my name, I'll be there in the midst. And so we claim that promise today, and he's here today. And I'm glad that we've experienced his presence already in the service this morning. And uh, the good singing has thrilled our hearts. And what a blessing. And what a blessing to see, see the young people and hear them sing the praises of the Lord. And then it's just good to gather together like this and have a time of fellowship around the precious Word of God. If you have your Bibles in Malachi chapter number 3, I'd like for you to stand, if you will, please, in reverence to the Word of God and pray for us today as we try to share a portion of the Word. Malachi chapter number 3. Let's begin reading verse number 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come. Well, I'm glad the Old Testament promise was, he shall come. Amen. Amen. We have that New Testament promise today as well. He will come. He that uh, shall come will come and will not tarry. But who, and notice this, saith the Lord of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former days. Now here in the book of Malachi, we read one of the famous and, of course, uh, where, where it appears here, the last Old Testament prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, or as we know him today, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice what it says about him. It says that he is the Lord. He will come. And, of course, we read the, the promise of the coming of the forerunner, John the Baptist, who came to prepare the way for him. And then it said, he will prepare the way before me, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. He's going to come first, and then the Lord's going to come. Hallelujah. The Lord whom ye seek, the messenger of the covenant. In chapter 4, he's called the son of righteousness. But here in chapter 3, in verse number 2, we find him identified as refiner's fire, and fuller's soap. The old, the, the old Testament pictures the Lord Jesus Christ in many ways, but here in his coming he's pictured as refiner's fire and fuller's soap. Now you can be seated, and we're going to pray, and I want to try to mind the Lord this morning, and that's all I want to do is let God have his way in the preaching of his word today, and if he doesn't help me, it won't, there won't be any preaching today. So you pray, and we'll pray God's will will be done. And I just want to look at one phrase in verse number 2. When he comes, what will he be like? Of course, he will be like refiner's fire to purge, but he will be like fuller's soap to cleanse. And I want to lift that phrase from that verse, he is like fuller's soap, and preach to you today about the Lord Jesus Christ as our divine cleanser. Father, we thank you for your blessings today. We thank you for your mercy today. We thank you for your grace, for your goodness, Lord. Uh, on the highways, you gave us traveling mercies, and you allowed us to come this way and be met together this morning in this service, Lord, with, uh, with this group of people, Lord, who are hungry to hear from heaven. And we pray, O oh Lord, today that you would, uh, Father, roll back the forces of evil. We pray, Lord, that you'd give us clarity of thought and mind and voice, and that you would come today and do for us, Lord, what we cannot do for ourselves. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us a fresh touch from on high. I pray that the Holy Spirit would have his will today in every heart and life of those who are gathered today. Lord, I pray you'll search us today. I pray that you'll put the spotlight of heaven upon our souls. As David said, Lord, see if there be in me any wicked way, any evil way. And Lord, would you cleanse that today? Would you take it away today that we may know you more fully, that we may walk with you more closely, that we may love you more dearly, that we may serve you, Lord, in acceptable ways during the days of our lives and our pilgrimage here in this world. 
Now, Lord, add your blessings to your word. Help us to see Jesus today. Lord, in a way maybe we've never seen him before. But, Father, help us to appreciate who he is and what he's done for our soul. And we'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, here in Malachi, chapter number 3, we find the promise of the coming of the just one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that when he comes, verse 2 says, he is like fuller's soap. He will be like soap to cleanse us. Amen. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we find the Lord Jesus pictured uh, in various ways. In Genesis, we see him as Noah's Ark, the refuge for our soul. We see him as Jacob's ladder, the access to heaven. We see him as Aaron's rod that budded the resurrection and the life. We see him in the brazen serpent as the one who was lifted up, that if we look upon him, we might live. But here in Malachi 3, verse number 2, we see him as fuller soap to cleanse us and make us fit for fellowship with, with our Heavenly Father, with the Lord God. And I want to share with you a few moments on that thought this morning. Now, I'd like to begin in the message in a discussion of the need for the soap. The need for the soap. The Scripture is uh, filled with expressions in the Old Testament as well as the New of man's need for cleansing. Uh, the man, man's need for cleansing is based upon the presence of a stain. Now, we need to be washed, we need to be cleansed when there is a stain, when, when we're soiled. And so the need for soap is dependent upon or based upon the presence of a stain. And my friend, since Adam walked out of the Garden of Eden and God closed the door behind him, sin left its stain upon mankind. Amen. Uh, as a matter of fact, God put Adam out of the Garden of Eden lest he eat of the tree and of life and live forever with that awful stain of sin upon him. Job 15 says this in verse number uh, 15, Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints, yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. Uh, God says, you know, if we look through our own eyes at our own selves, we, w we look for all the good things and we see all of the, uh, the colorful areas of our life and we see all the bright spots. But when God from heaven looks down upon us with his holy eyes, my friend, there is nothing that escapes his sight. Hebrews 4 says, and there is nothing that is hid from his eyes. Amen. And he who knows, sees all and knows all looks down upon mankind and he sees the awful stain of sin. Isaiah 64 tells us about this stain of sin in verse number 6. But, but we all... Uh, as an unclean thing, we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. When God looks down from his heaven, he sees mankind soiled and stained and corrupted with sin. Amen. And yet we realize that man had been created for fellowship with his God. Man had been created so that he could walk with God in the garden in the cool of the evening, so he could enjoy the presence of his Creator, so that he could dwell with him. But Habakkuk 1.13 says that God is of pure eyes and to behold iniquity and cannot look upon sin. And so man in his sin cannot have fellowship with the Holy God. David said it this way in Psalm 24. And uh, let me read you there in verse number, in Psalm 24 and verse uh, number uh, three, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in the holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who's not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Our greatest need today is to know our God. Our greatest need today is to walk with him. As a matter of fact, all the fulfillment and all the satisfaction of life lies in being able to have fellowship with that one for whom we were created to have fellowship with sin. And yet our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And in order for us to know our God and walk with our God and have fellowship with our God and enjoy our God, there is a deep need for our cleansing. Amen. Then notice secondly with me today, not only the need for the fuller soap, but also the desire for the soap. The desire for the soap. Now, the need for the soap is, is prompted by the presence of a stain. But the desire, the desire for cleansing is prompted by the consciousness of a stain. You hear me? The consciousness of a stain. You see, a, men can be dirty and not know it. 
As a matter of fact, uh, there where you work on the job, maybe you have, have the kind of job where you, you handle things that are dirty and you get the dirt on your hands or maybe on your face or maybe all over your body up, up where we're from, men work in the coal mines. And I'll tell you, when they come out, they're about as black as the coal that, that they mine. Amen. But did you know that you could walk around all day just as dirty and as black as coal and not ever know it unless you've got to look at yourself? Or unless someone told you that you were dirty, unless someone told you that you needed to be... And you say, why? Because you would not be conscious of the stain. Amen? Now, the stain of sin is the same way. We are all stained with the stain of sin. We're all soiled by the dirt of sin. But all men do not realize that. Amen? They need to be told about the stain of sin, or else they need, to, they need to take a good long look in the mirror of the Holy Word of God, amen, so that they can see themselves as God sees them, so that it'll point out the, every spot and every stain, so they can realize or become consciousness of their uncleanness in the eyes of a holy God. I think about the need for sin, but then there is the desire for sin. Amen? I mean, for the desire for cleansing, the need for cleansing, and the desire for the cleansing from sin. Notice with me, if you will, that if you can get a man to realize that he's dirty, most of the time he'll want to be clean. Amen? You see, that's what old-fashioned Bible preaching is all about. That's what old-fashioned Holy Spirit conviction is all about. If we can get people to realize that they're stained with sin, if they can see themselves as God sees them, then somewhere inside their heart there'll be a God-given desire to become clean, to come to Him for cleansing. Amen. As David said in Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgression. Listen to this. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression and listen to these words, and my sin is ever before me. You know what David was saying? He said, I see myself. My sin is before me. It's in my eyes. I look at David and I see how dirty David is and how soiled he is because of the sin that he's committed in the eyes of God. And Lord, I can't have fellowship with you like I used to out on the hillside while tending the sheep when I looked to the heavens and saw your handiwork and looked around me and saw your glory. Something's happened. Something's broken that fellowship between David and his God. And now he says, I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Oh, the desire for cleansing. When David realized that he was dirty, David wanted to be clean. I think about the prodigal over in Luke chapter 15 when he left the father's house. And he went into the far country, and there he wasted all his substance and riotous living. And you know the story as well as I do. He went down and joined himself to a certain citizen of that country, and he gave him a job going out to feed the hogs. Amen. And as that young man took his uh, a basket full of, of husks to go out and feed to the swine, you know where you find the swine? It says they were in the field. But you know if you go looking for a hog, you know where you'll find it? At the wallow. Amen. And what it means is at the nearest watering hole, you turn one loose, and that's where your head for and they'll stir up the stink and the muck and the mire. But I believe that day as that young boy went out to take the husk, to feed to the swine, as he leaned over the watering hole, he got a good look at himself, amen, as he saw his own reflection, as he saw his own reflection in the wallow of the hog mire that day, and then it said he came to himself, amen. He woke up, he came to himself, he saw his own sinfulness, he realized his own need for cleansing, and deep in his heart there was a God-given desire to repent of his sin and go home to his father. And so he came home and said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You know what the father said. He said, go get the best robe. Go get the ring. Go get the shoes. We're going to clean this boy up. We're going to put some new clothes on him. And although it doesn't tell it, I think somewhere between the old rags and the new garments, there was a good old-fashioned bath and good old-fashioned soap. Amen. There was a cleansing because that boy realized that he was dirty because of his sin. I think about the leper in Matthew chapter 8 who had a desire for cleansing. He said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Oh, every day he lived with the stink of that leprosy. Every day he lived with the rod of that leprosy. Just like our friends and our loved ones and our neighbors and those around us are living with the dirt and the corruption of sin. But he came to the one who was able to cleanse him. And he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. 
His heart's desire was to be clean so that he could walk with other people, have fellowship with other people, and most of all, so he could walk with the Lord and have fellowship with the Lamb of God. That cleanses us from all sin, bless his name. We see in the Scripture there is the need for cleansing, the presence of a stain. Then the desire for cleansing is born out of a consciousness of that stain. But notice this, if you will. I want to talk to you. Uh, I want to share something with you. Maybe you never thought about before, but about the third point of the message, the discovery of the fuller soap. There's the need for the soap, the cleanser. There's the desire for the soap or the cleanser. But then there is the discovery discovery of the soap or the cleanser. Now, I really want to take uh, use for an illustration today, real soap, if you will. Amen? And you know what that is right there? You know what that is right there? That's a bar of old-fashioned homemade soap. That's what that is. And it may have never occurred to you before, but, and it was, and, and when I found out, it, it stirred me up and excited me when I found out soap was not invented, soap was discovered. And I believe it'll stir you up too when you find out where soap was discovered, how soap was discovered. Did you know that soap was unknown to the ancient world? You read about it. You study about it. Soap was unknown to the ancient world, except for a few stems or berries off of certain plants, the only kind of soap they knew. But soap, as we know it, was unknown to the ancient world. The world spent nearly 4,000 years without soap until it was discovered. Now, do you know where it was discovered? Well, in, Ro in Roman times, there was a hill called Sappho Hill, or in interpreted Soap Hill. And on this hill, there was a temple, a pagan temple, to pagan gods. And one day, as the priest who carried away the refuse from underneath the altar in that pagan temple noticed that when the animal fat and the salt of the sacrifice cooked down into the wood ashes of the fire underneath the sacrifice, that they produced a substance which we know today as soap. You know what that is? That's wood, ashes, and water, which make lye, and animal fat, and salt. That's what's in that bar of soap right there. And that's what the priest on Sappho Hill found cooking underneath the altar at that pagan temple to that pagan god. But notice that that was the discovery of soap. Now notice the origin of soap. Although the, the priest at the pagan temple at Sappho Hill may be able to claim the discovery of soap, they cannot claim to have originated soap because they did not originate the burnt offering. Amen. Amen. Amen? As a matter of fact, on the very same day that the priest went up on that hill to clean up around the altar and found out that the substance underneath it was soap on another hill in another land in another city, there was another group of priests who were offering another sacrifice, amen, down in Jerusalem at the great temple of Jehovah. Yes, as the priests of the Lord were laying the burnt offering on the high altar, underneath it was forming the very same substance that they found in that pagan temple there on Sappho Hill. Amen. Underneath the altar of God, cooking as the animal fat. And by the way, the Lord said, the fat's mine. It goes on the altar. And salt, every sacrifice was salt. And as that fat and that salt cooked down into those wood ashes there in Jerusalem at that great altar in the temple of Solomon, right here's what was forming, amen. Soap. Oh, yeah, soap. And that's what the sacrifices were all about. And that's what the offering was all about, making a way so that you and I could may be made clean so that we could have fellowship with God. And so we could know God. And so we could be washed, amen. So that we could have clean hands and a pure heart and go into that holy place and worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now move back a little far farther. That substance forming underneath the altar at the temple was the same substance that had been forming underneath the altar at the tabernacle before that. Go back just a little bit farther. And what about the... What about the altar that Abraham built? Oh, yes, wood ashes, animal fat, salt, same ingredients, same substance. Amen. What about the altar of Noah in Noah's day? Go back just a little bit farther. What about that first offering that we read about? And Abel, amen, brought the firstlings of his flock and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. And the, the result of that sacrifice there was the same. It was soap, the byproduct. It was soap, amen. Now, let's go back one step farther than that. 
and they see a young man and woman standing outside a closed gate to a beautiful garden. And then we see the Ancient of Days in all its glory with fire in one hand and knife in the other, just like we saw Abraham leading Isaac up on the mountain. Amen. And there in their uncleanness, there with the stain of sin upon them, God the Heavenly Father comes down in love and mercy and offers for them a sacrifice for sin. The animals are, are slain, the coats of skin are made, and by the way, they, he placed the coats upon them with the blood side on the inside. Amen. Amen. So that they literally were covered with the blood of that sacrifice. Now, I don't know what you think about it, but I don't, I don't think God would deviate from his own example. I don't think he left any carcasses laying on the ground. I think he picked up the bloody pieces of the sacrifice, and just like every other sacrifice he ordered, he burned them there as a burnt offering, and as the fat of, those, of the, that sacrifice dripped down into the ashes underneath it, you know what was formed? Yeah. Amen. And what the soap was to do for the body, the sacrifice was to do for the soul. Hallelujah. It was to wash them and make them white so that they could once more walk in his presence and know fellowship with their creator. Amen. So we see the origin of the soap was in the, the very act of God in making a covering for sin for our original parents here on this earth. Now let me show you the mystery of the soap. Notice the mystery of the soap. Soap was unknown to the ancient world. That means that soap was unknown in the ancient world to the Jews as well as the Gentiles. Although it was present under every Jewish altar. Think about that. Every day they got up in the morning, they offered the sacrifice. Every evening, the time of the evening oblation, they offered the daily sacrifice. On all the feast days, they had all the extra uh, offerings to offer. On all the high holy days, they brought in so many more. And it was day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Those sacrifices were being burned upon Jewish altars. And can you imagine as literally tons of soap were hauled away from there and they never even recognized what it was? Remember what Malachi chapter 3 says? He will be like soap. You know what this soap's a picture of, don't you? It's a picture of Him. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our sacrifice for sin, who is our offering for sin, who is our cleansing for sin. And can, that you, can you imagine that for those hundreds and literally thousands of years that every day they offered the sacrifices and could not see Him? And He was right there before their very eyes. Oh, yes, He was. And in the Old Testament, Jesus was hidden from them. They had the veil over their eyes, amen, which they still have today unless they, through the Holy Spirit, are born into the family of God and the veil is taken away and they can see he was there all the time. He was there in Genesis, amen, as the seed of the woman. He was there in Exodus as the Passover lamb. He was there in Leviticus as the great high priest and the sacrifice of atonement. He was there in Deuteronomy as our, as our leader and the blesser of the tribes of God, the people of God. Oh, yes, from Genesis to Malachi, he was there all the time. And yet they could not see him. And when he came in person, they did not know him. He was hidden from their eyes, though right in front of their eyes, all the time. Notice also, all those years at the tabernacle and the temple, the, so the, the Jews had the soap right at their fingertips, but you know what they did with it? As though that animal fat and the salt from the, and the ashes from the sacrifice and the wood would cook down under the altar and form this substance right here. You know what they did with it? They did, went in with shovels, and they shoveled it up, and they carried it outside the gate, and they buried it. And that's exactly what they did with him. That's exactly what they did with him. He was there in the law. He was there in the prophets. He was there in every line. And yet when he came in person, they took him outside the gate and buried him. Well, I'm so glad he didn't stay in that grave. Amen. Yeah, they buried him, but the grave couldn't hold him. Hallelujah. But that's what they did. Notice something else. Even though 
Israel, under every altar, under every sacrifice, had soap there, which they could have been using the whole time. They could have seen Christ. They could have known him. Soap was unknown to the ancient world until it was discovered by the Gentiles. Amen. Oh, yeah. Not the Jews, but the Romans discovered it up on Sappho Hill. And when they did, its use was spread all over the world. Hallelujah. And he came into his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as received him. Amen. Oh, you have to just pardon me a little while I'm about to shout. Amen. Yeah. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The Jews didn't want him. They chose to go on with the stain of sin. But I'm glad today that all men everywhere can come to Jesus and get bathed in him, get washed in him, get made right, get made ready to, to enjoy fellowship and a walk with God. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. They had him the whole time and didn't know what it was. Guess what? We got him. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I've got him. You've got him. Notice the picture of the soap, if you will. Notice, first of all, the color of the soap. You see what color it is? It's the color of gold. Amen. Just like refiner's fire, just like the refiner goes out and gets the ore for the gold and puts it in a big crucible and turns the heat up until the metal melts out and runs down and he pours it out in little gold bars. In the same way, the, the fuller makes his soap. He gets all the ingredients and puts them in the kettle and cooks it down until he pours it out in little gold bars. Amen. Amen. And you know what gold speaks of? From the days, of, uh, from days immemorial, from, that, from the time of the tabernacle, gold spoke of royalty. Amen. And gold spoke of deity. Amen. Gold speaks in the, in, throughout the Word of God, symbolizes lordship. Remember the Ark of the Covenant that was overlaid with gold and on the top of it, round about it, there was a crown of gold and he is Lord. Amen. It speaks of lordship. It speaks of godhood. It speaks of glory and the glory world. He shall be like finer, fi, fuller soap. That tells me that this soap is a picture of him. He is the one who is of royal birth. He is the one whose deity we see written across the pages of the Word of God. Amen. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, not was a God. I had a lady try to tell me one time, the Word is a God. And I said, you only believe in one, and now you got two. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. And all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that is made. He said in John 10, I and my Father are one. And they took up stones to stone him, because he, being a man, made himself God. In John 14, there, uh, I believe it was uh, Philip that said, If you'll just show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. It'll suffice us. And he said, Have I been so long with you, Philip, and yet you have not known me? Oh, yes, he came down from the glory world. He came down from the city of gold. He came down from that world where he was glorified with the Father in the beginning before all things. Amen. This, the color of the soap speaks of his godhood. Then notice also the character of the soap. Now you see that piece of soap right there and you pour it out into a mold and it dries. Listen to this. You hear that? Beat it on the mic. It's hard like a rock. As a matter of fact, it looks like a brick. Amen. And listen to me, he is the unbreakable, omnipotent one. In the hardness of the soap, we see the rock of God. Deuteronomy 32, he's called the rock of our salvation. Oh, Jacob laid his head down on that rock and found rest and found the way home. Amen. In the wilderness, Moses smote that rock and the water came out enough for two and a half million people and all their cattle and rivers ran down in the desert. Hey, bet. I'm getting happy again. Yes. He's the rock of David. He's the rock that David said, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Hey, bet. Yes, he is. He's the rock that Jesus said your life must be built on or else it will be built on the sinking sands of life. But if it's built on the rock when the storm comes, it'll stand. Yes, it will. 
And then listen to me, it's the rock the church is built on today. Amen. On this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I know who's on the winning side tonight, today. Amen. Oh, yes, he is the rock. And beyond that, he's the rock of ages. Bless his name. And in the hardness of that soap, we see the rock of ages. But notice this. That, did you know that that same piece of soap that is hard like a rock can also be softened to fit into any mold? It can be softened to fit into any mold. And when he came down from his glory and came into this world, he said, I came not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Whatever you want, Heavenly Father, that's what I'll do. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And he softened himself to the will of God. And even in the garden as he prayed until his sweat was as great drops of blood, he said, Not my will, but thine be done. Bless his name. Notice also in that bar of soap we see the character. And we also see the color, but there's something else there. We see the flesh of that soap. Did you know that that piece of soap I hold in my hand is made out of flesh? Real flesh. That's not some kind of artificial ingredients. That's not some kind of chemicals that were put together in a chemistry lab. That's made out of real flesh. The animal fat is, is stripped away from the body or rendered away from the meat of the body and goes into the kettle where the soap is made. That's real flesh. And he who was God, a very God in glory softened himself, humbled himself, amen, and took on the fashion of a servant and came into this world as a babe born in Bethlehem, as a man walking among us, amen. He was in the world and the world was made by him. He came into this world uh, as the word of God, which John said was made flesh and dwelled among us and we beheld his glory. Oh, yes, God became a man in the Lord Jesus Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. In that piece of soap, we see what he gave for the world. My body, my flesh, which I will give for the world so that we might be clean, so that the stain of sin might be washed from our soul. But did you know that also in that bar of soap we see not only the, ble the flesh, but we see the precious blood? Did you know that you cannot make that bar of soap unless a life has been given? You could not have that piece of soap in your hand to wash your body and make you clean except that something had to die. And so it was the only way we could ever be made clean. The only way that we could ever be made whole, the only way that we could ever be made right with God and ready for heaven was that Jesus came down from heaven, humbled himself to the will of God, became a man, and laid his life down on the cross for you and I. He died that we might live. He gave his life for our cleansing. Bless his name. And as even the fat is rendered from the carcass, the little blood drops run into the kettle. And somewhere in that bar of soap is not only the animal's flesh, but it's blood as well. What can wash away my sin? <laughs> yes, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other fount I know, only this, the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. Did you know that in that bar of soap, there's also wood? It's one of the ingredients. You see, the wood ashes, the wood has to be completely burned and ashes gathered. And with, together with when the water is added to the wood ashes, it produces a strong alkali. We call it lye. That's why we call this lye soap. And the wood is a necessary ingredient. The flesh and blood by itself will not make a cleanser without that wood. And just Jesus' body and blood does not clean without it being shed there upon the cross of Calvary. It was there on the cross that they pierced his hands and his feet and the blood ran down. It was there on the cross that the soldier put the spear in his side and opened up the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins that sinners plunge beneath its flood lose all their guilty stains. Amen. 
Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved, washed, and clean to sin no more. Yes, hallelujah. He bare our sins in his own body on the tree. And Jesus said, except I be, be lifted up. The Son of Man must be lifted up in order to draw all men unto him. And it was on the tree that they lifted him up there and hung him up between the heavens and the earth to suffer, bleed, and die. And let me put this in right here. He did not die in heaven, though he might have. He did not die on earth, I mean, on the ground itself, though he might have. But he hung between the heavens and the earth as our mediator, as our daysman, as the only one who ever qualified to reach up with one hand and take hold of the hand of the Holy God and reach down with the other and take hold of the hand of a sinful man and bring the two together. Bless his name. Yes, glory. I shout on that myself. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. God and sinners reconciled in Jesus' death on Calvary. Yes, praise Him. Now notice it requires something else to make the soap. Not only the flesh and the blood and the wood, but the salt. And did you know that God required that every sacrifice was to be salted with salt, and when they did it, symbolized something. The priest would go out that day, and they would lay, the fire would be built, and the sacrifice would be properly slain, the blood caught, and they would take the carcass up to the altar and lift it up, the highest place there at the tabernacle in the temple, and lay it on the fire. And then he would step back and take a cruise of salt. And he would sprinkle it over the sacrifice. And he was as a sign of the covenant that God had made with Israel that this was being done according to the Word of God. Amen. And you can read that in Leviticus Amen. chapter number 2 and verse number 13. He would say according to the Word of God. Amen. We're doing this according to the Word of God. Did you know, folks, the only reason we have any right to do anything Amen. is because it's according to the Word of God. Amen. And even so, when the Son of God came down from His glory... Laid that manger in Bethlehem is according to the Word of God because Micah said that's where he'd be born. Amen. Oh, yeah. Everywhere he went and everything he did, he was fulfilling what had already been written in the Word of God. And you read especially carefully about his death and you'll find out as the gospel writers recorded his death, they said this was done that it might be fulfilled which was written in the Scriptures concerning him. And as he walked up Calvary that day, I want you to know something, folks. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an afterthought. It was according to the Word and the will of God. It was the affording of counsel and uh, the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God. For he himself had stood as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so it was according to the Word of God. Now take the animal flesh, if you will, and the blood and the salt and the wood, uh, the wood to, to make the fire. But there must be a fire, and that flesh and that blood must pass through the fire. It must pass through the fire where it cooks together, and the necessary chemistry takes place to produce this substance which we call soap. Did you know the Bible says the wages of sin is death? And that's not just the heart stopping. That's not just the lung ceasing to function. That's not just the body going to sleep. Amen. John told us what death really was over in Revelation chapter 20 when he said, And whosoever was not found written in the book was cast into the lake of fire, the lake which burneth with fire. Fire is, always will be, the, a picture of the wrath of God and the judgment against sin. And listen to me today. You know who deserves the fire? You know where I would be today if I had my just reward? Yeah, they quit preaching about it. They quit telling about it. But they haven't changed the fact that there is a literal fiery burning hell. But in his passion, in his death for me upon Calvary, he went through the fire. As he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? and endured for, for all time and eternity the pains of hell as the Father turned His very face from His own son. He took my fire. He passed through the fire for you and I. Boy, listen to me. If I want to be clean, if I want to be right with God, if I want to be ready, I don't have to give my flesh. He's already given His. I don't have to give my blood. He's already given His. 
I don't have to go to Calvary. Although I should have, I deserve to be there. But had I been crucified there, it wouldn't have saved me. It would have been one more criminal, one more sinner, just getting what he deserved. But because he went there, I can go free. And if I want to be right with God and clean before him, I don't have to go through the fire. He's already been through the fire. I just need to get the soap. Amen. Yeah. I just need him. He'll clean me up. And he'll make me right. Let me give you the last thing hurriedly. Notice the power of the soap. The power of this soap lies in the fact that it's an all-purpose soap. As a matter of fact, when I bought this uh, cake of soap, it had a wrapper on it, which at the bottom said, all-purpose soap. You know what that means? That means you can use it for anything. Our forefathers made it the old-fashioned way. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I just like the old-fashioned way. <laughs> yes, they did. They made it the old-fashioned way, and they used it to wash the walls, and they used it to scrub the floors, and they used it to clean the windows, and they used it to do their washing. I remember standing as a little boy and watching my granny crumble it up in the washing machine. Amen? Oh, yes, I do. They used it to wash their bodies, to bathe their bodies. They used it to wash their hair. Amen? Whatever the need is, it'll meet the need. Hallelujah. Yeah. John, John said it this way in 1 John chapter 1, and you already know it, but I'm going to read it anyhow. He said, if we say that we have no sin, what do we do? We deceive ourselves. Amen. Yeah. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in you. You want to tell me you don't need God's soap, and I'll say the Bible says that's a lie. You're just fooling yourself. There's not a one of us here this morning that in ourselves we stand unclean in the eyes of God. If we, de we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, that means you're not being honest with God. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. Now, here's the part I like. From all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. It's an all-purpose thing. And I want you to know when Jesus walked up Calvary and gave his life there a ransom for you and I, he died for all sin, for all time, for all eternity. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Hallelujah. Yes, he did. Bless his name. You know why they used, our forefathers used it for everything? It was all they had. You know something else? It was all they needed. <laughs> yeah. I remember when old time religion was all we had and all we needed. And I've got news for you, it still is. Yes. The power of this soap lies in the fact that it's all purpose thing. 1 Corinthians 6 said some of you used to be effeminate, some of you used to be thieves, you used to be robbers, you used to be crooks, you used to be whoremongers, and you name it, fill in the blank. But he said, but now you're... Oh, yes, I remember the day he took me down to Calvary and washed me whiter than snow, bless his name. Notice, secondly, the power of this soap lies in the fact that it's all pure. There's nothing in that bar of soap but animal fat and wood ashes and salt and the ingredients that I read to you about today. There's nothing else in there. Now, what's important about that? You know what's important about that? Is this. We live in a day... Hey, I went down to the store, grocery store to find a bar of this. I couldn't find any down there. I had, as a matter of fact, there's one old store up there in Anawalk. <laughs> it's been there for a long time. And this stuff had been, laid, been pushed, put on the back shelf because nobody didn't want it anymore. You know why? Because there's so many different brands now. Amen. Yeah. Got something newer. Got something that claims to be better. Amen. Yeah, and they added a lot of stuff to it. They put stuff in it to make it smell better. 
They put stuff in it to make it softer. They put stuff in it to make it smoother. Amen. They put stuff in it to make it a little bit brighter, to make it a little more enticing. They put stuff in it to make it a little more colorful and a little more fancy. But it won't get the dirt out like this one will. Amen. Yeah. Everything they add to it, they destroy its cleansing power. I like the old kind. It's just pure stuff. Amen. It may be a little harsh to your skin, but it'll go down deep and it'll cut the dirt. It might take a little, it might take a little hide with it, but you might need that. Yeah. I found out when I went to God's house and got my hide skin, it just rolled back thicker and better. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. It'll get the job done. We live in a world where they've got churches and preachers and Bibles that's all watered down and smoothed out and they've soft soaked God's salvation. And we need to get back to the stuff. Amen. I'm glad I got the right stuff. I'm glad I found the right stuff when I found here. Yeah. Its power lies in its all-purposeness. Its power lies in its all-purity. Amen. And its power lies in its accomplishment. Just take your Bible real quick, and I, want, I don't want to take too much time. Turn real quick, Revelation 1. Let me show you its accomplishment. It'll get the job done. What job? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ. You remember Malachi 3 said he's going to come. Buddy, you can mark her down in the fullness of time. He came. He will come. And when he comes, he will be like fuller soap. Yeah. And it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, he kept his word. He came. And the first begotten of the dead, they buried him, but he rose again. And the prince of the kings of the earth, look at this, unto him that loved us. I'm talking about the accomplishments of the soap and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's in there. <laughs> Amen. He didn't stop there, though. The next verse said, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It could have never happened unless he had come to cleanse us from our sin. Notice chapter number 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened. In Genesis chapter 3, God stands with Adam and Eve with the knife and the fire and the animals waiting to, pair, to be sacrificed, he stands there in front of a door that's now been closed because they've been stained with sin. But now that he's loved us and washed us from our sins in his own precious blood, the door's open. Hallelujah. Yeah. He opened up the way. Nobody would have got there if he hadn't washed us up and opened the door and let us in. Yes, the accomplishments of the son. Notice down in verse number 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed, clothed in dirty garments. Uh-uh. No. Now I left those down at the hog pen. <laughs> oh, yes. Clothed in white raiment. White and clean. Hallelujah. Notice in chapter number 19. And I'm done. Chapter number 19, verse number 7, Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is coming. His wife has made herself ready. What did she have to do to get ready? Well, I'll tell you, she wasn't sending up boards. She wasn't hanging on. She wasn't holding out. You know what she did to get ready? Verse number 8, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Look at this. White and clean. Clean and white. <laughs> clean and white. For fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Amen? 
And the next following part tells about how she comes back with him on that white horse, clothed in that fine linen, clean and white, accomplishment. And the last point of the message, the soap is powerful because of its availability. Now, I had to look for it to find it. I couldn't find it just anywhere. As a matter of fact, on the shelves where all the other soap wasn't where it was supposed to be, it wasn't there. I had to look for it, but you know what? It was there. Still available. Still available. Old-fashioned Bible preaching churches are few and far between, but God still got some. Old-fashioned Christians that are born again of the Holy Spirit and walk with God may be few and far between, but God still got some. A clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the, with the Holy Spirit to convict and to convert may be few and far between the instances where we find it, but He's still around. And it's available to anybody that wants it. Just go and get it. Come to Him. He'll cleanse you. You want know to notice about this stuff? To get it in your eyes, it'll bring tears. Sure will. Oh yes, it will. You know where the tears? We 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 ask today a lot of times the question: Where's the tears? Where's the soap? Yeah. You get around where the soap that you'll get some tears. I'll tell you something else about it. If you trample it under your feet, you'll slip and fall. And I believe Asaph in Psalm 73 said, Though of the wicked, their feet are set in slippery places. You know why? They're walking on the surface. Amen. And their foot shall slide in due time. Amen. And you know where the destination is of everybody that casts away the soap and tramples underfoot the blood of the covenant. Amen. The lamb went through the fire for them. Amen. But if they reject him, they'll go through the fire for them. Just get the soap. Just get washed up. Just get ready. His name is Jesus, and if you'll come to him and let him have his way, you'll experience what Titus 3 and 5 calls the washing of regeneration. Amen. And you can, like these young ladies were singing about a while ago, you can have a brand new life. He will come, and when he comes, he'll be like full of soap. God bless you.